Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey gang, Frog and Owl Show stuff came out. The Frog Show is over, and the Owl Show is basically over, so let's talk about them now. I'll start with Frog Show. I started watching it during the break between seasons 2 and 3 since everyone was telling me to watch it and stuff. And it didn't really click with me at first. The first half of season one just kind of felt like any generic kids cartoon, and like, it wasn't bad. It was mildly charming, the characters were likable enough, and there were some good jokes. But it also didn't really feel like anything I'd get super invested in. Everyone kept telling me, oh, you gotta make it to episode 10, that's where the plot comes in. And then there's more filler, but then episode 20, oh, it's so good, that's where more plot comes in. Whatever, man. On my first viewing, it was kind of a slog. I don't mind quote-unquote filler if the characters are extremely entertaining and fun to watch. But like I said, on my first viewing, I only found the main four to be likable enough. Anne was an okay protagonist, Sprague was an okay enough child character, Polly was just kind of an extremely one-note, haha, little baby who wants to take over the world character, and Hot Pop... Okay, Hot Pop was actually pretty much perfect from the start. I don't feel safe! But overall, I wasn't as in love with this main cast as I was with, say, the main cast of Gravity Falls or The Owl House. Another problem I had compared to those shows is that while those shows promoted degeneracy by having less than moral role model characters like Grunkle Stan and Ida, Amphibia felt like a complete 180. Season 1 is extremely obsessed with teaching Anne and Sprague moral lessons, and it makes the season feel kinda samey and generic. Not to mention a lot more geared towards kids than those other Disney Channel shows I like. It's fine, it's good to teach kids moral lessons, but like, what am I, as a 24 year old man, getting out of this children's show? I know that sounds like a really dumb and nonsensical question to be asking, but when Gravity Falls and Owl House targeted the same demographic, and still managed to be entertaining and clever for people my age, yeah, I don't know, the frog show just wasn't cutting it for me in season 1. That's not to say I hated it, it was mildly amusing and likable, and there were some standout episodes. I really liked Snow Day, Cracking Mrs. Croker, Children of the Spore, and Bizarre Bizarre, the latter of which was a great indication of the tone and quality of season 2. I will also always be grateful to this show for Suspicion Island, because, well, you know why. And yeah, like everyone said, episodes 10 and 20 were pretty good, and enough to hook me to watch season 2 and see where the plot went. The conflict between Anne and Sasha was really compelling, and I was interested to see more of her. But yeah, overall, this season's just kinda like a 6 out of 10 to me. I just feel like a lot of it is rather uninteresting and skippable. And yes, I understand the argument that the quote unquote filler episodes are there to endear you to the characters more and understand their dynamics better, which in turn makes future plot centric episodes hit harder. I would never suggest to anyone who wants to watch Amphibia that they should skip all or even most of season 1, but at the same at the same time, you absolutely don't need to see all of it to still enjoy seasons 2 and 3. A show doesn't need 39 episodes to endear you to characters enough to make future dramatic plotlines with those characters matter. For instance, each season of Infinity Train only has 10 episodes to tell an entire story with certain characters, and I still found those stories dramatically impactful by the end. Amphibia just doesn't need this many episodes to establish its characters before the plot gets moving in season 2. And as a matter of fact, when I showed Amphibia to my friends, I actively skipped a good number of season 1 episodes and they missed nothing. They still understood everything going on in the next two seasons, and they were just as emotionally impacted by the dramatic moments as I, a person who saw the entire series, was. So, if you're curious, Patrick and I put together a list of Amphibia episodes you can probably skip. However, if you'd rather see everything the show has to offer, go right ahead and watch all of season 1. I don't really know how popular of an opinion not caring too much about season 1 is. I had another friend who watched all of season 1 and they kind of felt the same way as I did about it, but I know other people who wholeheartedly love season 1. Ultimately, it's up to you how you want to get through it. The bottom line is, even if you're not too engaged by it, it's absolutely worth getting to season 2 for. Season 2 is a huge step up in my opinion, and pretty much the best season of the whole show. The jokes and overall writing are a lot better, we go to awesome new places in the world like Newtopia and the temples, the plot is actually in motion most of the time, the filler episodes are more entertaining and worth checking out, and we meet some of the show's best characters here. 
Before we get to them, it's worth mentioning that the moral lessons learned in Season 2 feel a lot more dramatically compelling and less childishly presented. The planters aren't necessarily teaching Anne moral lessons, since they're just as unfamiliar with Newtopia and the world outside Wartwood as Anne is. So instead of, huh, wow, thanks planners, I guess I really learned a valuable lesson and became more responsible, in like every other episode, it's more like one of the characters betrays another character's trust in a way that wasn't malicious but still stings and they have to work through their baggage with each other over the course of multiple episodes. Yeah, this season has a liar reveal story that actually f***ing works, can you believe that? There's also great characterization and drama when we get to see Anne, Sasha, and Marcy interact with each other, and holy shit, it's time to talk about Marcy now. Easily my favorite character in the whole show. She's such a lovable little scrunklow who's so funny and endearing and plays off the other characters and the overall world so well. At first, I really wished she was the main character instead of Anne, but then I thought about it and realized that the whole lovable goofball archetype is already the main character of a bunch of other Disney Channel shows. Like, we already got Mabel, Star and lose, so it's probably for the best that they did something different here and gave us a more grounded protagonist in Anne. Still, Marcy's amazing and I love every scene with her in it. Another favorite of mine introduced this season is Andreas. He's voiced by Keith David and I love Keith David's voice. It really adds a ton to this character. And that's about all I can say about him right now. Anyway, I could talk about my favorite episodes this season, but we'd be here all day. Still, I'm just gonna rattle them off real quick. A caravan named Desire, Susan Egan shows up and we get to see more of Hop Pop's passion for acting. It's very wholesome. Toad Catcher, seeing Sasha and Grime connect more as they do battle with Yunin, Scourge of the something something I forgot the whole thing, is awesome. Yunin really needed to be in this season more, for real. Wax Museum, with the Gravity Falls reference, come on! On! I really like the idea that in an alternate universe without Dipper and Mabel's influence, Grunkle Stan is just a full-on villain. Such an awesome episode. The planners check in. I really love getting into shenanigans at hotels, and Sprig does just that while interacting with Newt Mabel, so that's fun. Sprig gets schooled, just because of the mileage my friends and I got out of this one line. Dream! Dream! Forget the dang dang dream! Feel free to play that clip whenever someone's talking about Dream Minecraft. Little Frog Town was great because Hop Pop killed a man. Hoppy Mall was great because the ending was really wholesome, and also because of the Smash Bros reference. Oh yeah, this show has so many gaming references, it's so cool to spot them all. There's an Earthbound reference, a Fire Emblem reference, the ancient amphibian technology looks like Breath of the Wild, there's a Razor Sword from Majora's Mask in the background of one shot, there's probably another Majora's Mask reference later, I don't know, we'll see. But yeah, those references are certified Kino. Oh yeah, I also really like the sleepover to end all sleepovers, After the Rain, All the Temple episodes, Maddie and Marcy, Barrels, Warhammer, The Dinner, and Battle of the Bands. Great shit. And there's very few episodes this season I dislike or would want to skip as well. Alright, now it's time to talk about true colors. This is officially the point of no return. If you want to watch Amphibia and you don't want to get spoiled, skip to this time frame. 3, 2, 1, Polly. So, uh, True Colors is one of the best episodes of any cartoon I have ever watched. Dare I say, it is a perfect episode. The part where the gang tries to thwart Sasha and Grimes' takeover is great, but it becomes way more intensely dramatic when the duo realize there's something wrong with Andreas, and that seizing control from him might have been doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. And yeah, obviously the episode really gets going in the second half. Andreas is one of the most effective twist villains I've seen, since the fact that he's up to something is foreshadowed earlier in the season without letting us know just how sinister his plans and true colors are. He's also such an effective antagonist because his jovial goofball personality wasn't just an act. He really is that silly while also being a pure evil tyrant at the same time. Which is great because now we don't have to re-establish what evil Andreas is like. He's the same character we know. He's just also a crazy murderer. Marcy's betrayal is really messed up, even though you understand why she did it. It's that one line, the look at Sprague, I gave you this, I gave you everything, that just hits me every time. Like, there's so much to unpack there. She did this awful thing, but good managed to come out of it. And it doesn't justify her actions, but at the same time, it's just... Ugh, it's a lot to unpack for sure. The animation and music during the fight scenes is nothing short of spectacular, especially when Anne gets her powers. And oh my god, we gotta talk about that content warning at the beginning. The whole episode, you're just thinking, what the f*** would be too scary for younger viewers in this happy-go-lucky frog show? Then you see Andrea step on Polly, and it's like, oh, that's probably what it is. Okay, that's not too bad. But then you see she's fine. 
Then he drops Sprague out a window, and you're like, oh, it's probably Sprague falling to his death. But then he's saved, and you're like, oh, I guess it wasn't that either. Huh. I wonder what it's gonna be. Oh my god! I don't know how they were allowed to let Marcy get impaled, but the shock of that moment, coupled with the shock of Anne and the planners suddenly getting whisked away to Earth, just cannot be overstated. That's how you end a fucking season. Season 2 gets an 8 out of 10. It's so awesome. Anyway, season 3 wasn't as good. I feel like a lot of the momentum from True Colors was lost, and the stakes don't feel quite as high in the first half of the third season. Since there's a lot of episodes where Anne and the planners are just vibing and not really trying to find a way to get back to Amphibia. I also feel like they really dumbed down Hop Pop. Like, I can understand Sprig and Polly being completely naive and incompetent when dealing with this strange new world. And obviously this should apply to Hop Pop to an extent, but... I don't know, they kind of made him feel like another one of the kids in terms of Anne having to make sure he doesn't get into trouble. It's a bit at odds with how responsible he is in the first two seasons, and it's a bit jarring. But I still really like the Earth episodes despite these problems. They're a lot more interesting than most of season one. The fish out of water stuff with the planners is pretty fun, and I love the new human characters like Mr. and Mrs. Boonchoy, Mr. X and Jenny, Jess and Allie, Dr. Jan, that actor guy, Hot Poppy Friends. They're all really fun. Plus, it's not like the Earth episodes are filler. You need to establish these characters since they come back later and help Anne and the planners get back to Amphibia. Plus, establishing Earth itself is important to make the semi-final episode impactful. I also wanted to mention just how funny this first half of the season was. Like, they really outdid themselves with some of these jokes. Eat the rich! So yeah, I enjoyed 3A, even though I kinda wish there were more episodes like Olivia and Yunin. Holy shit, why was that so dark? I almost felt like death would have been a kinder fate for Marcy at that point. Anywho, yeah, 3A was good, even though it clearly should have ended on the Escape to Amphibia episode and not the Christmas one. But yeah, I was really excited to finally get back to Amphibia and see the war effort. Oh my god, this is so boring. Season 3B is about as interesting as Season 1, despite the fact that it should really be more plot focused at this point. Again, these are perfectly charming episodes in a vacuum, but they do so little to advance the story and they're just so repetitive. They all boil down to running into some sort of returning character, either helping them with their problem or fighting them if they're evil, and then recruiting them for the war effort. Rinse and repeat. I guess this would be fine if these characters mattered to the final few episodes, like how the humans mattered to escape to Amphibia. But they really didn't. They all just boiled down to being a distraction for Andreas while the main characters infiltrated the castle. They accomplished nothing. Season 3B accomplishes nothing until the final few episodes. Well, this is disappointing. Even the Olm episodes don't really tell us anything we don't already know, and they absolutely did not need to be two episodes. Unlike the Core and the King, which really needed to be double length in order to sell us on the friendship between Andreas, Leaf, and Beryl. Like, we still do get the insight into Andreas's character that the episode's designed to give us. We can definitely infer the fact that his friends meant a lot to him, but the episode still felt rushed as all hell and the character's connection would have been conveyed so much better if there was 22 minutes to do it. Like, legit, I don't even remember a single character trait or line Barrel had. Oh well, despite Season 3B's problems, it was all worth it for the last two episodes, which are my second and third favorites in the entire show, after True Colors. All In does wonders for everyone's characters. Anne lives up to her true potential, the planners get some closure by defeating the herons that destroyed their family, Sasha acknowledges how much she's grown, Marcy rejects Mabel Land and accepts reality, Andreas surrenders upon learning that Leaf still cared about him, and speaking of someone with no experience with K-pop, I honestly really liked that they used the sort of music a 13-year-old girl like Anne would listen to as a way to motivate her. This episode was awesome and absolutely worth the buildup it had over the course of the whole series. And do I even need to talk about the finale? That shit made me sob harder than any other series finale I can think of. It's just so beautiful and perfectly bittersweet, portraying the themes of change and moving on so wonderfully. It's a small detail, but I really love the fact that Anne and Sasha fell into different friend groups in high school, since that's pretty realistic. Sometimes you just don't spend time with people anymore when you grow up since you're going in different directions, but that doesn't mean your connection isn't still strong. That, plus the fact that the two worlds remain separate, is such a beautiful encapsulation of the show's themes. Sprague and Anne will always have each other, even if they're worlds apart. 
I just think everyone here got a really wonderful ending. I was even surprisingly okay with the way Andreas was redeemed. It felt believable and earned, despite the atrocities he committed. I also just now noticed that I haven't even mentioned the core yet in this video. Yeah, the core is a good villain, very scary concept, I liked it. Anyway, I do wish the episode could have been a bit longer and show what happened to even more of the side characters, especially the ones on Earth who straight up don't appear at all. But even with all that said, I think this might just be my favorite ending to any Disney Channel show. Like, I prefer Weird Mageddon 3 as an episode because I thought it had a better climax on top of an amazing emotional ending, but in terms of the actual conclusion this episode leaves for its characters, yeah, this is a bit better just in terms of how beautiful and bittersweet it is. I won't spoil the Gravity Falls ending in case you haven't seen the show, but I'll just say that the Grunk Will Stand thing felt like a bit of a cop-out. And if that felt like a bit of a cop-out, then don't even get me started on the way Star vs. the Forces of Evil ended. Holy f**k. Amphibia does what Star didn't have the balls to do and ends in the way it should. It's perfect. And like I said, it made me cry so hard. Thinking back to the first season and how I didn't really click with it that much, it's truly astounding how attached I got to these characters and this world over time. Amphibia had bumps along the way, sure. There's a lot of filler that doesn't really entertain too much. Season 3B is weirdly weak until the final two episodes. Polly never really became that interesting to me over the course of the series. And man, I wish there was more of Marcy. I missed her so much in Season 3, you guys have no idea. But at the end of the day, I really appreciate and care about this show, warts and all. Anne's journey to become a more selfless and responsible person was beautiful. Sprague and Hot Pop were delightful companions with a fair share of compelling emotional baggage. The redemptions of so many antagonists like Sasha, Grime, and Andreas were handled incredibly well. And I love that lovable scrunko Marcy so much. I'm really gonna miss these characters and this world. Hell, I already do and it hasn't even been a month since it ended yet. I wouldn't rank it above Gravity Falls, Phineas and Ferb, or Owl House as it currently stands, but it's an absolutely worthwhile watch with a ton of hilarious jokes and incredible moments. I'll give Season 3 a 7 out of 10, and if we average the scores of all three seasons, that also brings the score for the whole series to a 7. But that just seems a little too low. When a serialized story has an ending this amazing, it honestly elevates the entire experience, in the same way a terrible ending makes it so you never want to watch the show again. So I'm gonna break my not believing in decimal streak just this once and give Amphibia a 7.5 out of 10. Not always great, but when it is, it's f***ing phenomenal. Definitely worth a watch, if you don't mind the slow burn at the start. And now, a quick intermission before we move on to Owl Show. And by intermission, I mean live theater. Forsooth, I'm but a lowly farmer who just wants to make a website. How will I ever do so? Oh, hey, I know, with Squarespace. Well, problem solved, end of play. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password protected pages to share private works with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design Design automatically includes a unique mobile presence that matches the overall style of your website, so your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is so simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains, so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, .org, or you can always get a more specific one like .art if you want to be fancy. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right. I talked a lot about Amphibia and I'm kind of tired, so I'm going to keep this Owl House Season 2B discussion very brief. 
I don't have too much to say about anything except the final episode, so let's get through this. The season's still really great, but there were a couple episodes that were a little weirdly paced and laid out in terms of story. The one where Luz tries to help Kiki Mora in order to feel better about her own inability to see her mom was just kind of weird and whatever, but the Ida Rain stuff in that episode was pretty good. The one where Hunter met Willow and Gus just felt super generic for some reason, like an early season 1 episode, but it wasn't bad. There's still a ton of absolute banger episodes, both in terms of being strong character building ones like Reaching Out and Them's the Breaks Kid, while also having really strong plot focused episodes like Elsewhere and Else When, Hollow Mind, and Edge of the World, the latter of which was my favorite episode in the season. I know a ton of people freaked out over Hollow Mind, and yeah, it was excellent, but it also just kinda confirmed the same things the fans had already figured out, or that the show had already spelled out earlier, like Hunter's origins and Bellos' true identity. It was still cool to see how the characters in the show reacted to this horrifying information, but Edge of the World offered information that was both horrifying and not really known to us yet. King being a titan makes perfect sense, and it ties such a seemingly loose thread from the first half of season 2 into the main plot beautifully. This episode filled me with so much dread and sorrow, and I got a little choked up when King said hi to the Titan's husk at the end. So yeah, banger episode that I feel like not enough people are talking about. Um, actually, Hollow Mind was more dramatic, because in it we learned that the Day of Unity is actually a draining spell to kill all witches, and now we know that Hunter doesn't have some sort of big role from the Titan, and he's actually just infinitely expendable. Okay, that's fair. Anyway, Patrick, you got any other opinions to share? Well, in my opinion, Bellos, or should I call him Darth Widabane, is actually a great antagonist now. Philip is one of those psychopathic villains who thinks they're the good guy. He's an old-timey British f from the 1600s, so of course he would think that witches don't deserve rights, and kill them all without any sense of remorse. It's all for the good of humanity in his eyes. But is he willing to kill a fellow human to save humanity? Of course I am! Not only did Philip kill his own brother in cold blood for falling in love with a witch, he has cloned and killed his brother for what seems to be thousands of times. It's like that joke Alex made about killing Marty and then cloning him and killing all his clones, but played entirely straight. Hunter is a mass-produced entity who has been murdered by their own father figure countless times. Safe to say, Philip is like Diet Frollo. And Diet Frollo is still a really good villain. It makes perfect sense that in a show about Luz befriending witches and demons, the true evil was the human we met along the way. Philip is the worst of humanity, so he doesn't play fair or have any honor when it comes to say, I don't know, holding his end of bargains. I don't actually mind that this literal slime ball operates like that anymore. It fits with his sleazy personality, and besides, him breaking deals is what ultimately bites him in the ass. It's like they heard that Patrick had a problem with villains who don't hold up their end of the bargain, and specifically catered that bellow scene in the finale to him. But before we get to that, here's a few more stray thoughts I want to toss in. I completely agree about Bellos, and I believe Season 2B made him an antagonist worthy of this show. Not quite as good as Andreas, but hey, what are you gonna do? Uh, everyone teaming up to fight Amity's mom was great, but I just wish this wasn't the second episode she appeared in. She could have used a bit more buildup. I know it's never gonna happen, but I would love for a spinoff featuring Ida and Rain's school days. They're just so charming, especially young Ida. I also want to mention how underrated of a character Principal Bump is. Like, every time I see him, I'm like, hey, that guy's funny and likable. Why does no one ever talk about him? Um, I don't get the Hunter Willow ship at all, but I'm not actively against it either. If it happens, whatever. If it doesn't happen, whatever. Uh, season 2 B needed more epic hootie moments, but it was still really great. Every episode still feels important, and while some were a bit weaker than others and some elements lacked buildup, the season still remains excellent and the buildup to the Day of Unity was so perfectly filled with dread. I also have some stray thoughts, like, when Elsewhere and Elsewhen brought up time travel as a possibility, I thought it would have been too complicated and messy, especially with them introducing time travel this late in the show. However, I was pleasantly surprised that the time travel was a perfectly closed-off time loop. 
And it provided a clever explanation as to why the Emperor has been letting the Owl Gang get away with shit. He needed Luz to be free so she could go back in time and enable him to meet the Collector. Speaking of the Collector, it's a good thing Luz learned about them right before her and King went to the Titan Trapper Island. So in retrospect, it was a really good thing that Hootie ate that letter. Everyone apologized to Hootie, he did literally everything right in his starring episode. Such is fitting for this perfect being. Also Steve. I like Steve. Okay, so yeah, great season. I don't like the way it ended. That's not to say I don't like the finale episode itself. A lot of it was well executed for what it was trying to do. I just don't like what it was trying to do. The first half is great, with Luz's battle against Belos, who then morphs into Calamity Belos, being incredible. Gus seeing all of Belos' memories is really fucking raw, as was all the shit Hunter had to deal with, good lord. It's all great stuff. And then the Collector gets freed and they one-shot Belos and that's it, problem solved. So let's talk about the Collector. As a concept, I like the idea of this ultra-powerful godlike child, but I really don't like the idea of them usurping Belos as the main antagonist. Now, we don't know if that's going to be the case. I mean, Belos probably isn't dead since they showed part of his goop getting on Hunter. But the thing is, Season 2 was largely dedicated to setting up Belos as an intimidating and interesting antagonist. It did so much legwork to make him a worthy foe, but one thing it didn't have time for was the Collector. We barely got any information on this little scrunklo. We know they started this whole Titan killing cult, but we don't know why they hate Titans. Whether it's because of something rooted in their past, or just because they love chaos and spreading it everywhere. Honestly, because of how vague the Collector's goals are, I struggle to find myself intimidated by them as an antagonist, in spite of their godlike powers. Like, the current threat is that they're reshaping the world to play the Owl House game, but what does that entail? We don't get a glimpse of how threatening that would be. As is, it feels like King could talk them out of whatever they're doing by just explaining that the rules of the Owl House game don't require terraforming the land, because they are a stupid child who would probably believe him. Now, I feel like my thoughts on this could change if we see that what the Collector's doing is super horrific in Season 3. Then I'll be like, okay, yeah, shit's f***ed. But as is, they stop the draining spell pretty easily, and whatever the Collector's doing doesn't feel as drastic or dangerous despite their godlike powers, since they don't seem to be evil. At least, they're not nearly as evil as Belos. And I really hate to do this, but considering how similar the plot structures of these episodes are, let's compare this to True Colors for a second. Amphibia spoilers again, uh, skip to this time frame if you haven't seen Amphibia and shit. In both of these episodes, we have initial antagonists that are defeated in order to make room for a new threat. Sasha and Grime are taken down so Andreas can be revealed as the true antagonist, and Belos is one-shotted so the Collector can take over as the biggest threat. The main difference is that True Colors dedicates over half the episode to evil Andreas, while also escalating and clearly defining the stakes. He will literally conquer all worlds if he's not defeated. That's a step up from Sasha and Grime just taking over this one kingdom. Meanwhile, the Collector is only the main antagonist for the last five minutes. That's fine since they wanted to make this episode Bellocentric and only set the Collector up for the next season, but again, the stakes at the end are murky and feel far less dangerous than all the Coven Witches on the Boiling Isles dying. If they show us that the Collector is doing something to everyone that could be considered a fate worse than death, like making everyone into their personal playthings or something, then okay, I can get on board with the stakes now. But the fact that we don't really know what they're doing just makes the drama and King's sacrifice at the end fall really flat. It feels pedestrian for this show, especially after all the build-up and amazing episodes this season has had, and double especially when you compare it to the shocking drama of the season 2 finale of what's more or less been its sister show, Amphibia. This episode even does the same ending as True Colors, with the main protagonist and their friends slash family finally returning to the human world, but getting trapped there, unable to save their friends in the other realm. But again, I feel like Amphibia did this better since the planners have incredibly well-defined lives and relationships in Wartwood, and the idea of Anne taking them in after they took her in is really clever and powerful. But Willow, Gus, Amity, and Hunter? First of all, Hunter has nowhere else to go and nothing 
really left for him in the Boiling Isles, so getting trapped in the human realm was kinda the best case scenario for him. Amity has a mostly loving family, sure, but considering how strong her relationship with Luz is, the fact that they're not separated makes a bit of the drama of her getting trapped here fall flat. I'm glad they still get to be together considering how little time we have left with them, but it doesn't do the drama much favors. And Willow and Gus? Yeah, they have lives and families, but we've never really gotten to see their parents that much, so that falls a bit flat as well. Overall, I don't know man, it was a good episode, but as a finale, I feel like it kinda blew it in terms of getting me invested to see what happens next. And most of my issues tie back to the idea of the Collector as the main antagonist. Bellos just felt like such a thematically smart villain for the show. Being this stuck-in-the-past dude who opposes wild magic and free expression of who you are, which is what the heroes of the show have always thrived by exploring. I just really struggle to see how the Collector fits into the show's themes, and I'm far from being sold on them as a threat or a character. Maybe what's left of Season 3 will change my mind though, just like how Season 2 changed my mind on Bellos. And yeah, that's kind of the elephant in the room we have to address. There is a good chance that the Collector would have been built up and explored more in this season if it wasn't for Disney canceling the show and forcing them to condense the story. Wouldn't you rather, uh, I don't know, have a beach day? Oh, you had to bring that up. So my distaste for how they've handled the Collector so far might not be the fault of the creative team. No matter the reason, I just think this is the second season finale in a row that didn't quite live up to how great the rest of the season was. I really don't want to be a doomer when it comes to this show, I'm cautiously optimistic that they'll stick the landing in the end, despite Disney clipping their wings. But, I will share with you guys one horrific dark thought I had. Bellos getting defeated like that? Reminded me of how Toffee went out in Star. No, 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 no! I'm sorry, I'm sure this show will end in a better way than that show, but the parallels are there. Season 2B gets an 8 out of 10 for me, and I guess I'll do another decimal score, sure, why not? 8.5 out of 10 for the season as a whole. It's some really good shit, and you should definitely watch it. And I'm sure Season 3 will be totally fine, don't you worry. Oh yeah, the Lumini kiss was really sweet, I forgot to mention that. Patrick, you got anything else to say? I think it would have been a lot more interesting if the Luz Collector theory was true. Then everyone would have to go back to the human realm and explain what happened to Luz to Camilla. That would have been a wild ride. But that's okay, we didn't get something super dramatic. At least Lumini is together in the human realm, meaning these two lovebirds can have fun little mundane adventures like vibing at the beach. Oh wait, there's no time for fun because Disney hates fun, especially when said fun involves two girls dressing up and traveling. I feel like Dana and the crew will have plenty of time to wrap up the story, but I feel like now would have actually been a nice time to have a bit of filler. But oh well! I don't have any concise closing statement other than I want a crossover series about Marcy and Hootie going on adventures. Yeah, that's about it. Also, Rain's clearly not dead, you fools. They stopped the draining spell, that means they're fine. Good night, Boiling Isles. Oh yeah, I also need to mention Dry Hootie, Dry Hootie. Yes.